a look at parametric equations of conic sections. And so we start off with this very famous identity that we know and love, the Pythagorean identity, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So we can make two different substitutions here and both of them are going to yield the same conic section. So for example, if I say let x equal sine of t and y equal cosine of t, we will see that if we plug this in, we would get x squared plus y squared equals 1, which we know as our friend the unit circle. So in this case, if we let x equal sine of t and y equal cosine of t be our parametric representations, remember from before, Parametric representations mean we define x and y independently in terms of t. So in this case, we would have a definition of the unit circle. Now, if we think about what that would look like, let's draw ourselves a little picture. And let's think about different important values here. So when t is equal to zero, it would be sine of zero, which is zero and cosine of zero, which is one. So the point would be zero comma one, which is up here. And then when I plug in our next important point, pi over two, sine of pi over two is one, cosine of pi over two is zero, and so we're down here. So we're graphing the unit circle starting from up here and moving in the clockwise direction. Now, if I instead done a parametric representation where I said let x equal cosine of t and y equal sine of t, I again still have the relationship that x squared plus y squared is equal to cosine squared plus sine squared, still equal to one. However, if I go and graph it this time, If I plug in the value t equals zero, t equals zero would be cosine of zero, which is one, sine of zero, which is zero. I'd be starting here when t equals zero. So then let's see where I end up as I move along. If t is pi over two, we know that the cosine of pi over two is zero and the sine of pi over two is one. So we actually go here. So in this case, our unit circle starts on the x-axis and moves in the counterclockwise, the sort of trig direction that we're more used to. So depending on how we make our parametrics, how we define our x and our y, we'll get the same shape, right? We still get the unit circle in both situations. However, one starts on the x-axis and goes counterclockwise, shown here. The other one started on the positive y-axis and moved clockwise. Could you think of any more? Are there any other ways to define x and y such that x squared plus y squared still gives me one? There are, and I'll let you think about those for a moment. How to graph parametrics in Desmos. We can see we've written the equation for the unit circle up here. Um, so I'm gonna go with the more traditional that x is defined to be cosine of t and y is defined to be sine of t parametric uh, version of the unit circle. So the way we graph a parametric equation in Desmos is we write a set of parentheses, think an ordered pair, and we write the x equation first, comma the y equation second. So cosine of t, sine of t. And what you'll notice once I change the color to something slightly different, it's graphing this dark blue section over here because it's only using the values from zero to one. Right, to get the whole unit circle, we have to go, well, pi over two would just get me um, a quarter of the way there. If I go by pi, it's half the way. To get the whole unit circle, I need to go a whole two pi. Another way that I like to represent this so I can actually see the direction is I'm gonna just use a, an unknown variable. So I'll call it a. So cosine of a and sine of a. And we can add this thing called a slider. And so if I use the slider from zero to two pi, and I start it at zero, 
and then I hit play, I can actually watch it go around the unit circle from 0 to 2 pi. And now it's going backwards. I can send it always to go in the same direction. So you can watch that as t increases, in this case it's just known as a, it's going around the unit circle in the counterclockwise direction. We can also see that when t equals 0, we're on the positive x-axis at the point 1 comma 0. If we were to use the an alternative representation of the unit circle, sine being the x, cosine being the y, now when we watch it travel around the unit circle, we see it starts at 0, 1 and travels clockwise. How we would write parametric equations for an ellipse. So again, always remember cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. So here's the equation of an ellipse that I have over here. And we're getting pretty familiar with the ellipse, so we can recognize that the center is going to be at the point 3, comma, negative 4, the hk value. We have an a value of 5. Um, a is with the x-coordinate because it's the largest, so this is a wide ellipse. And our b value being 3, and thus our c value would be 4. But I want you to compare these two equations. They're both equal to 1. So we can make a substitution that would lead us to a similar situation to how we use the unit circle. So in this case, I'm going to say let cosine of t, this could be any variable, a, t, whatever you'd like, I'll use t. Cosine of t is going to be defined as everything inside my first parentheses, so x minus 3 all over 5. And in a similar way, sine of t is going to be equal to y plus 4 over 3. And then if I solve for x and y, we see that x is equal to 5 cosine t plus 3, and y is equal to 3 sine t minus 4. So now if I go into Desmos and I graph my parametric, which remember we just use parentheses, so that's the x equation, the y equation, and you see we've got this little lime green section over here. If I go 0 to pi, we get half the ellipse, I almost called it a circle, it's definitely an ellipse. And if I go the whole 0 to 2 pi, you can see the entire ellipse. And just like I did before, if I make this an unknown constant, I add a slider and I'll go from 0 to 2 pi. We can actually watch it travel around this ellipse. Yeah, I want it to start right at the beginning. So that's over there at the point 8, negative 4. And we'll watch it travel all the way around from 0 to 2 pi. And so this is one way you can define an ellipse using parametric equations. You make a direct comparison to cosine squared plus sine squared, solve for your x and y variables, and you are good to go. For a hyperbola. So unfortunately, the hyperbola has a minus sign in it. So this cosine squared plus sine squared identity isn't really going to help us. We do remember that if we divide this identity by cosine squared, we get 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. And another way to think about this identity is it's equal to secant squared minus tangent squared, which is equal to 1. This has more of the flavor of our hyperbola. We have something squared minus something else squared set equal to 1. So if we directly compare this version of the equation to, say, x over 3 squared minus y over 2 squared equals to 1, which as we see is a hyperbola, we can then make the substitutions like we've been doing for the other conic sections. In this case, secant is always going to be the positive quantity. So in this case being x over 3, which means that x is equal to 3 secant t. In this case, tangent will always be the negative quantity in the hyperbola, y over 2, which means that y equals 2 tangent t. 
So we can go and we can graph our parametric representation now that we have it. If I just asked you for it, you can just say x equals 3 secant t or y equals 2 tangent t. But I do just want to show you the graph is r equivalent. And again, you have to go from 0 to 2 pi to get the entire graph. So be careful. This one, it matters a little bit more versus the sine and cosine. You have to make sure you make the positive quantity secant and the negative quantity tangent, or this secant squared minus tangent squared equals 1 identity will not hold true. I ignored probably the most basic conic section, your very famous parabola. And so you might be thinking to yourself, ugh, well, there's definitely no like x squared, cosine squared, sine with one squared and one not squared identity. Um, and that's because parabolas, parametric representations don't involve trig functions. They're the only ones. In this case, if you just say let t x equal to t, well, if y is equal to x squared, then y is equal to t squared in this case. So we have the representation t, t squared. And so if you go, uh, in this case, because it's not trigonometric, you actually have to find all possible values of t to graph the entire parabola. So you can make much fancier parabolas. You can say uh, 4 x squared minus 1. You have something like that. Again, your independent variable, in this case, which is x, your y is just the original equation written in terms of t. So parabolas are just a little bit more boring, and that's why we don't spend as much time on their parametric representation. I always say it's just as important to know the formula as to know where the formula comes from. So again, the ellipse and the circle are all based off this identity that cosine squared t plus sine squared t is always equal to 1. That's our favorite Pythagorean identity. It does not matter so much in the ellipse circle situation which variable you define to be cosine or sine. In some cases, it might make more sense to do x or y or y or x. While it won't affect the overall shape if you define it on its uh, entire domain, it will change starting point and direction. The hyperbola was based on a related Pythagorean identity, secant squared minus tangent squared is equal to 1. In this case, it does make a big difference as to which one you're defining to be secant versus tangent. Secant's always the one that's positive in the hyperbola equation, and tangent is always the one you're subtracting. Parabolas, unfortunately, they're just not as exciting to define. So say you had y x equals y squared plus 4, you would say let t be equal to y, and thus x is equal to t squared plus 4. So not the most entertaining, not the most trig oriented, but again, it will complete our set of parametric equations of conic sections. So hopefully this clarified some things from the assignment and let me know if you have any questions.